good afternoon i welcome all of you to this distinguished lecture by professor filippo osella professor of anthropology and also professor of south asian studies i particularly extend a warm welcome to our guest who has come to the center for regional studies as a visiting professor i understand that the interaction with our students and research scholars went on very well and then it was very beneficial to our students and research scholars before professor shela prasad gives a formal introduction about our speaker i will take one minute to introduce our school to professor osella school of social sciences is about 38 years old and it has five departments one department is dormant at to completely take shape that is department of education and education technology otherwise we have four disciplinary departments political science history sociology anthropology we have eight interdisciplinary centers working in several contemporary issues and of these interdisciplinary centers center for regional studies is the first center that came up much before any other center came up then other centers like uh, the social exclusion and inclusive policy gender studies human rights diaspora ambedkar studies so we have eight centers in the school of social sciences and one thing we mention is the recognition all the departments in this school have received from the university grants commission a recognition for the excellence in the form of special assistance programs the department of political science has been recognized as center for advanced studies sociology also is in advanced stage with regard to special assistance program followed by history and anthropology in fact ours is the largest school in the university in terms of faculty strength and also student strength 72 faculty members and then about 800 students almost half of them are research scholars so the school of social sciences is a very vibrant place for learning and also research so with these few words again i welcome you to this distinguished lecture now i request professor shela prasad to give a formal introduction about our speaker thank you <clears throat> thank you professor venkatra uh let me also add to what uh, professor venkatra said and welcome uh, professor filippo sella to both our university and the school of social sciences and i would really like to express on behalf of the center for regional studies and my colleagues and students that for the crs we are really really happy that professor osella accepted uh, to come uh, for three days and uh, we know what you know he's got a very hectic schedule he's been tra traveling across half of the world china dubai and then i don't know where else before he landed in uh, cochin and then hyderabad uh for uh, many of us uh, professor osala's work doesn't really need much of an introduction especially for those uh, of our friends and colleagues who are from uh, kerala and who are uh, researching issues of uh, particularly islam uh, and muslims in south asia uh one indication of the kind of reach and popularity of his work is 
the kind of demands that have been made on his time by research scholars since Monday and uh, you know where uh, he's had to sort of spend his afternoons, mornings and late evenings with students in different locations, conference room, CRS classroom and then guest house and maybe even the library lawns which was I think further uh, which was shelved because of the mosquito menace. Okay, uh, so uh, but for those of you who are not familiar with Professor Usala's work, let me give you a not a long formal introduction you can do that by you know searching him on the net but i'm just highlighting some of his major contributions uh, he is a professor of anthropology and south asian studies at the university of sussex in england or uk uh, he has a phd in social anthropology from the london school of economics and political science and his broad research interests are, and this is really, really interesting because it's a very mixed bag. Uh, you have gender and masculinity, you have Islam and Hinduism, there's migration, uh, there is a very, very committed interest on South Asia. His current interests appear to be trade and entrepreneurship in both, and he's doing a kind of a comparative study of China and uh, you know, in India, Kerala particularly. And I think his one of his most, most recent interests, which he's talking about later on today, is on charity and philanthropy in South Asia. His areas of uh, study are also, you know, you know, they're shifting or they're enlarging in the sense from South A Kerala, he moved to South Asia because he included Sri Lanka. And then uh, he, he moved to Southwest Asia and now there is this whole interest with China and um, you know of course the South Asia uh, interest continues you know it's a sustaining interest. Uh, I'm not sure but I didn't ask him but I do know from my conversations with people who do know him that he's pretty fluent in Malayalam and I don't know uh, if he knows any other languages you know maybe arabic or chinese you know mandarin or whatever or whatever um, about his work his you know his publications he has a lot of publications uh, beginning uh, with his first uh, book which was part of his uh, doctoral work and what is interesting is he came to kerala for his research as an mphil student in 1985 so this is, you know, a, a really long sustained interest for over 30 years now. And of course, he came back again for his PhD. So um, a part of his PhD work was social mobility in Kerala. And then there have been a lot of other books with uh, other scholars. Uh, I'm just reading out a few. 2017, there is an edited volume. Uh, with um, Radniki, which is called uh, Religion and Morality of the Market. Uh, in 2012, with Caroline Osella, Islamic Reforms in South Asia. And then in 2010, Islam, Politics and Anthropology. Uh, again in 2006, Caroline Osella and Filippo, Men and Masculinities in South India. And in 2004, there's an edited volume on migration, modernity, and social transformation in um, South Asia. And then, of course, I told you about his first book called Social Mobility in Kerala. Uh, Professor Osala is also very actively involved with uh, being on the editorial board of a number of uh, leading journals, Journal of Contemporary Islam, South Asia Research, Culture, Society and Masculinities, Religion and Society, Migration and Development. And this kind of tells us the wide ranging interests that Professor Osella has. And I think that is something that we in the Center for Regional Studies are really, really appreciative of. Because we feel that while he's grounded in anthropology, Professor Osella is, uh, you know, an example for many of us of how to do interdisciplinary research, uh, in particularly in social sciences. Uh, you know, there are lessons, if a reading of his work 
offers us lessons on research methodology, on uh, doing ethnography, on what the field challenges of the field are for many of us that we have faced or continue to face in our own research areas. Uh, over the last three days, what struck us most in the center was Professor Osella's interaction with the research scholars of not just the center, but the School of Social Sciences and also the Center for Comparative Literature and Communication. Um, those interactions were, you know, packed. We had over 75 students yesterday, uh, the whole morning in which Professor Osella was sharing anecdotes from his own work, elaborating on his experiences in the field, comparing different field sites and contexts, and also engaging with the wide range of subjects of research that our own students are doing. And um, in fact, you know, uh, both yesterday and today morning in these student interactions, we had to literally drag him, uh, you know, uh, out for lunch. And uh, he didn't help because he said, oh, I could spend a few more hours. So we looked as if, you know, we were the villains of the piece. But, um, you know, lunch is also, and then he had the distinguished lecture here. Finally, we at the center, we are a small center. We usually have to work over time, every time we organize a talk, lecture, event, to generally mobilize an audience of students. But both yesterday morning and today morning, we found that our research scholars had heard of Professor Osella's work, were interested in the kind of questions that he was raising, and ensured you know, that they had a engaging interaction with him. So thank you again, Professor Osella, for being with us. And we at the center are particularly privileged to have you as our guest. Professor Venkatarao, Professor Sheila Prasad, Dr. Aravind Sudsala, I would like to thank you for having uh, invited me here. And uh, also I would like to thank, of course, the, the School of Social Sciences and the Center for Regional Study for having given me such a wonderful opportunity, not as much as to present my own work, but to interact with uh, your student and uh, your faculty. And indeed, for me, it's been a very uh, interesting experience to learn about the high cal caliber and, and cutting edge research which has been carried out here by uh, your students. So thank you very much for the invitation and th thank you very much for the hospitality, the very kind hospitality that you extended to me in the last, uh, for the last two days. So, but uh, without further ado, I would like to move on to uh, um, the purpose of today's, uh, of us being here today, which is uh, uh, my, uh, the lecture. The lecture which is entitled Charity and Philanthropy in, in South Asia. And to some extent is a reflection on my uh, uh, a recent work, a re work which I carried out both in Kerala and Sri Lanka in the last uh, six or seven years. So here it begins. There are no reliable figures to help us measure the volume of charitable, charitable donations in South Asia. But according to the 2014 World Giving Index, charitable and philanthropic activity appears to permeate all levels of society. In recent years, South Asian publics have been mobilized to give for humanitarian relief and reconstruction in the wake of uh, natural disasters or in the aftermath of communal violence, while the Indian government has introduced legislation to make corporate philanthropy mandatory. Economic liberalization and consequent redefinition of the scope and range of state welfare across the region has lent a new impetus and significance to organized forms of charitable and philanthropic giving as a means to deliver social welfare, humanitarian aid, and more generally, to foster socioeconomic development. In the meantime, entrepreneurs, IT entrepreneur, as in Premzi, has pledged close to $5 billion to charitable purposes. And industrialists such as Ratan Tata, Anand Mahindra, and Narayana Murthy have made multi-million dollar donation to American universities, projecting 
the reach and influence of South Asian philanthropy beyond the shores of the subcontinent. Even in the face of such an apparent proliferation of giving, uh, relatively little has been written about the politics of charitable acts and philanthropic individuals outside the Western world, South Asia included, with much existing research focused on Europe and the United States. This might not come as a surprise in that considerable literature links philanthropy to the rise of modernity and capitalism in the West, and therefore contrasts modern philanthropy with more traditional forms of gift giving. Existing research on the politics of giving in South Asia has tended to reinforce this perspective, implicitly just opposing the embeddedness of South Asian giving in religious morality with apparent universalist humanitarianism of modern philanthropy. Reflecting on my own ethnographic research on Muslim charitable practices in Kerala and Sri Lanka, the aim of my talk is to examine the interconnections and influences of different modalities of giving, seeking to unsettle a dyadic focus on tradition and modernity, which ultimately consigns South Asian charity and philanthropy to the realms of either naked instrumentalism or religious piety. Arguing that altruism and self-interest might not be necessarily at odds with each other as we, led, as we have been led to believe, my research explored the everyday working of economies of morality in which profit and piety might coalesce or appear antithetical in equal ease. Although the rise of secular philanthropy is generally associated with a shift in sensibility where love of humanity replaces love for God, love of God, in practice it is often impossible to disentangle religious and secular motivations for giving and receiving. I would argue that it is crucial to investigate the specific historical and political context in which charitable practices unfold, exploring historical transformation of practices embedded in different traditions of giving, and to show how these not only draw on each other, but also relate to translocal politics of development, community formation, and nation building. Focusing on both formal and informal religious, humanitarian, familial, and corporal giving practices in the region and its diaspora, my research has examined the relationship between indigenous and global concepts of charity and voluntarism, as they are understood and enacted by donors, mediators, and beneficiaries. It also explores debates underpinning current practices of giving located in the cultures or religious orientation and aesthetics of specific social groups. Modalities, ideologies, and aesthetics of giving are constitutive of a wide range of social cultural practices in South Asia, from those concerning the reproduction of caste status, kingship relations, and political patronage, to those objectifying specific soteriologies or religious rituals. Indeed, there is a rich vocabulary to define and differentiate the scope and direction of non-reciprocal modalities of giving, as well as their obligatory or voluntary nature. Alms to mendicants, contribution, whether of money, time, or kind, to support the upliftment of individual and communities, gifts to religious or, se to religious or secular organizations providing services or social protection, blood and organ donation, and such, are acts which might be glossed as expressive or charitable or philanthropic dispositions, and indeed analyzed as such. The complex histories of Asian modalities of giving should warn us, however, of the perils of such a move. The issue is not simply one of translation. Canonical modalities of giving in South Asia, dana or zakat, for instance, cannot be glossed too easily by a European or North American notions of charity. Charity and philanthropy are culturally and ideologically loaded terms relating to modalities of giving embedded in a specific genealogy of Christian secular understanding of the relations between self and other, altruism and self-interest, immanence and transcendence. In Europe, this history is often, and I suggest rather unhelpfully, represented as a linear shift from medieval to early modern Christian charity, a means to ensure personal salvation through acts of mercy and generosity, to 19th and 20th century humanitarian philanthropy, the responsibility to alleviate the actual conditions of suffering of an, an unindifferentiated humanity that is associated with the emergence of a liberal bourgeois self, 
are the interstices of modern capitalism and Protestant Reformation. Importantly, this universalizing teleology is sustained by normative assumptions concerning the nature of charitable giving, namely its disinterested and non-reciprocal character, against which historically or culturally specific practices of giving are benchmarked and inevitably found wanting. Pitting altruism and self-interest against each other leads predictably and unproductively to questioning motivations and legitimacy whenever actual practice diverges from formal definitions of what constitutes charity or pertains to economic practice. The history of European charity, however, reveals degrees of complexity which ill-fits modernist teleologies or ideal types, thus allowing us to dislodge self-Asian modalities of giving from the iron cage of cultural exceptionalism. In later medieval Christian monastic institutions, for instance, the establishment of lay orders which protected and advanced monastic interests allowed for the acceptance and management of substantial charitable donations without impinging on teleologies of apostolic poverty and esoteriology of salvation. And whilst in medieval Europe charitable donation to monastery and to the poor entailed various degrees of self-interest calculation for the sake of salvation as well as expectations of reciprocity, of reciprocity via the prayers and blessings extended by recipients, in post-reformation England, charity to the poor was seldom anonymous and hidden. Donors to Protestant almshouses expected to gain spiritual rewards not only through the gift itself, but through the ongoing prayers of the beneficiaries. At the same time, in 16th century Europe, Catholic and Protestant charities established to provide the respite from rapacious money lenders themselves lent money at an interest and used the latter to support the poor. And in Calvinist Germany, deacons encouraged a recipient of alms, especially those capable of working, to regard them as loans rather than gifts. In an opposite move, in 16th century Catholic Spain, economic loans were represented as a generous act of charitable gift-giving, which elicited a counter-gift from the recipient, rather than a repayment with accrued interest. Here, the vertical and horizontal integrative force of Christian charity, connecting the donor to God and to a community of brethren, respectively, was a rhetorically privileged over the ostensibly immoral world of barefaced commerce and usury. That is, pays to differences between Catholic and Protestant uh, theologies there appear to be as much continuity as breaks in the history of Christian charity in Europe, which undermine linear teleologies. Moreover, we find that both charity and commerce entail quantification, calculation and careful accounting, suggesting that the economy of the market and the economy of piety can easily come together to sustain modalities of accumulation in which material wealth and spiritual merits may appear simultaneously as incommensurable and working through each other. 200 years later, the instrumental and self-interest nature of 18th century English charity is revealed in Bernard Mandenville and Adam Smith's respective critique of those who stress the identity of charitable virtue and mercantile interest. Mandeville dismissed merchants' charity as driven by, quote, lust and vanity rather than Christian virtue. For Adam Smith, charity reproduced relations of patronage and dependency through which the poor were reduced to a condition of degrading quasi-slavery. For both, charity neither improved the lives of the poor nor did he enhance the economic prosperity of the nation, fostering instead dependency, idleness and wastefulness. The eventual waning of a moral economy of mercantilism pave the way to the formulation of novel techniques and pedagogies for reforming the poor via moral and vocational education, extended by a plethora of charitable institutions. This is a major theme in 19th century British philanthropy, with its stresses on the deserving poor, which was accompanied by an awareness of a potentially transforming impact of giving, but also the realization this might not lead to changes in the life outcomes of the recipients. Projects of social moral reforms articulated through charitable intervention thus came to serve as prosthetics 
to the working of free market commerce and enterprise. Historically, then, the worlds of charity, economic practice and political calculation have seldom been apart. A connection that has led some researchers to represent modern charity, perhaps too narrowly, as the handmaiden of capitalism. In fact, a religiosity continued to play an important role in various forms of modern charitable giving. So the 19th century German, uh, German nouveau riche gave liberally to cleanse themselves of the stink of new money. Here, the transformative nature of charitable involuntary action is quite clear, making saints out of sinners, absolving the givers of the taint of evil, mobilizing self-interest for the common good, or more generally, creating pious subjects for a new Jerusalem. But this transformative effect is not limited to the world of a religious giver. The literature of more ostensibly secular philanthropies, for example, biographies of Rockefeller's and Carnegie are also replaced with refer references to the transformative power of giving. Thus, we find that amongst contemporary philanthropists, especially those participating in the tradition of North American individual and corporate giving, animating powerful philanthropic foundations and charitable trust, a rhetoric attributing accumulation of wealth only to entrepreneurial skills, hard work, and virtuosity turns economic success into a moral responsibility to foster the common good. Here, the moral discourse of philanthropic benevolence not only engenders interventions we complement or replace altogether state welfare, state welfare, but legitimizes and naturalizes class inequalities and the privileges of elites whose philanthropic endeavors ostensibly trigger the trickle down of wealth on society as a whole. And yet, the opportunities afforded by charity and philanthropy of making economic success equivalent to moral worth have not been exploited solely by contemporary philanthropic capitalists in North America and beyond. From Renaissance Italy and Ottoman Turkey to late Ming China and, as we will discuss today, South Asia, emerging elites mobilize charitable giving not only to establish networks and build social connection, or to secure political alliances and illicit allegiance, but also to claim participation in and eventually transform existing hierarchies of status from the tainted position of the upstart nouveau riche. We have seen that in the history of Christian charity in Europe, immanence and transcendence went hand in hand, regardless of theologies asserting the contrary whilst European and North American philanthropy allow for the simultaneous objectification of projects of individual self-aggrandizement and moral virtuosity. Moreover, the ingenuity of actual practice is such that it can ensure the smoothing out of tensions between worldly passions and overworldly yearnings. That is, the complex and contradictory history of Western tradition of charitable or philanthropic giving destabilizes attempts to plot South Asian charity on a traditional modern grid, and in so doing allows us to consider instead specific instances through which social actors may bring together or keep apart the apparently contradictory qualities and expansive potentials of giving. Reverend Samuel Mathieu, a zealous London Missionary Society minister, who spent more than 30 years, from 1859 to 1891, in the princely state of Travancore, described the place as, quote, one of the great stronghold of Hinduism and caste in the south of India. And it is distinguished as the land of piety and charity for its liberal support of Brahminical religion and priesthood. No less than one-fifth of the whole annual revenue of the state is expended on the support of the Brahman temples and priests. This is not an expression of charity Matthias condones. The influential classes, he continues, are united in the support and defense of this formidable system of imposture and superstition. After recounting the grander royal festivals conducted at the Padmanabha, Padmanabha Swami temple, he lists the substantial expenses incurred from various celebrities to conclude, quote, much evil arises from the gluttony disorder and vice incidental upon the attendance of these crowds of sensual idolaters. Matthias' lurid rhetoric is somewhat predictable. After all, 
His writing is directed to stir the repugnance of a God-fearing English audience whose Christian charity must be elicited to sustain the proselytizing efforts of a London missionary society in South India. Indeed, much of Matthias's book is devoted to, to reporting the spread of the gospel in Travancore among, quote, untouchable enslaved caste. Confidently, he reassures his readers that the charitable effort of mission schools and hospitals were leading to the moral enlightenment of the heathens, as well as to the spread of novel disposition towards industry and progress. He is also keen to distance Protestant missions from their Catholic counterpart, who, face, who faced at the time far less opposition from upper caste Hindus, in that, Matthias writes, in common with Hindus, they, they practice image worship, processions, and pompous ceremonies, and they observe caste to some extent. Reverend Matir encourages readers to compare the wastefulness of native as well as Catholic charity to the enlightened charitable work of Protestant missions and the civilizing endeavor of empire. The targets of his narratives are modalities of giving constitutive of pre-colonial Hindu kingship in South India, whereby donation to temple deities and Brahmins not only lent moral and political legitimacy to rulers, but allowed for the integration of an otherwise fragmented polity, as well as accommodation of landowning or trading communities. As a polder of Dharma, the ruler participated in the hierarchical redistribution of ritual honors and resources flowing from temples. Although by the time of British colonial expansion, the contours of such a, such a galactic polity were more marked in South India, elsewhere in the subcontinent, comparable politics of giving sustained statecraft. Unlike previous Muslim ruling dynasties, they established religious endowments, uh, Alkaf, to support mosques and madrasa, Mughal rulers made substantial personal grants to peers and religious scholars as acts of piety and devotion and to ensure the loyalty or at least acquiescence of the prominent religious lineages of Hindustan. Likewise, in Ceylon, kingship was, a, kingship was objectified and legitimized through the flow of gifts from rulers to the Buddhist Sangha and laity. Beyond the realm of pre-colonial kingship, donations to temples, Brahmin and religious institutions were part and parcel of landowning or merchant elite's pursuit of piety status and reputation. What Reverend Matir calls native charity, then, was more than a tool for the art of governing, but constituted ontologically and practically actual polities as well as economies. Across South Asia, land granted to temples, mosques, madrasas, and monasteries was rented out to various constituencies. South Indian temples used the revenues from endowments to lend money to traders and farmers, securing interest on repayments. Merchants could utilize endowments to family temples and deities as a reserve of capital to finance debts or credit. Donations to temples allow merchants to access novel markets and expand trade networks in South Asia and beyond. That is, pious dispositions and economic or political interests did not stand at opposite poles of a moral spectrum, but mutually constituted each other through various modalities of giving. In the rush, to denounce the moral depravity of the heathens, Reverend Matir had no inclination to interrogate the political and economic consequences of Christian charity extended by Protestant missions to South Indians. By the end of the 19th century, extensive conversions of members of so-called untouchable communities became a demographic threat to case-based politics of the Hindu princely state of Travancore leading eventually to the abolition of rules restricting access to government employment, education, and temples to Avarna Hindus. Protestant missionaries, encouraging and facilitating the recruitment of converted ex untouchable agricultural laborers, as indentured coolie labor for the colonial plantation economy. These, I argue, are not unfortunate spillages of self-interested instrumentalism onto the idealized virtuous altruism of charity. In the practice of giving in South Asia, as much as in Europe or North America, interest and disinterest materialize as different sides of the same coin. Here I'm not seeking to gloss over the complex soteriological underpinnings 
and theological interpretation which dif differentiate practices of religious giving in South Asia, or to deny their heterogeneity and historicity. Rather than imagining an implausible South Asian culture of giving, I simply underscore the productive power of giving, which can be at best controlled or contained, but not entirely erased, even when its returns might be utterly otherworldly and immaterial, as in promises of eventual salvation or release from cycles of rebirth, or in the warm glow ensuing from secular practices of humanitarian giving. I also note the sacrificial nature of giving entails both purification of the self and a notion of increase. What is given is a return multiplied, either as merits for the afterlife or wealth, fortune and auspiciousness in this life. The merit economy of giving that is might and does produce material returns and underpin actual economies. Reverend Matthias Avan Lettre, the Weberian narrative of inevitable, inevitable rationalization, moral enlightenment, and socioeconomic progress engendered by conversion to Protestant Christianity, points us to wider debates taking place in 19th century South Asia concerning the purpose and scope of so-called native charity. In the closing years of the 18th century, colonial administrators, missionaries, and British commercial concern supported schools, hospitals, and famine, famine relief through their charitable uh, practices. Colonial intervention were informed by contemporary notions of charity and philanthropy, shaped as much as by Protestant theology as by theories and practices of British utilitarianism and liberalism. Bringing, to, bringing together the hidden hand of providence and that of the market, British and North European charity had more from an act of unconditional mercy to a means to foster the common good and along the way to discipline the poor, the vagrants, the sick, the elderly, and the disabled. By the 1830s, South Asian merchants and entrepreneurial elites, whose trading interests had become dependent on a close interaction with the practices and cultures of a colonial economy, were encouraged to turn the largesse on their alms giving and religious endowments to the same purpose. From Halalabad and Surat to Bombay, Madras, and Colombo, participation in charitable initiatives prompted by colonial administration and British businesses, as well as the patronage of local institutions, art, and culture, endeavors often rewarded with colonial titles and honors, afforded the emerging indigenous elite novel means to establish individual status and trustworthiness to build political career, to gain the goodwill of the colonial administration, and to participate in emerging politics of community building and assertion. Wealthy Anglophile, Gujarati and Parsi businessmen and entrepreneurs, who in many cases had made substantial fortunes in the early 19th century through the trade of opium to China, are exemplary figures of such a shift. However, colonial cajoling of merchant and intellectual elites went hand in hand with introduction of regulations seeking to define clear boundaries between either two overlapping practices of private and public charity. Starting with the 1860 Societies Act, successive colonial legislation limited the scope of a time-honored tradition of religious charitable endowments, establishing along the way another rhetoric of public duty. The colonial juridical interventions which introduced the instrument of a trust inserted a wedge between the realm of self-interest profit uh, or self-interest self self-interested profit making and charity, redefining the latter, the latter in terms of general public utility. By doing so, it simultaneously disembedded the market from the responsibilities entailed in existing modalities of social codependency and via the introduction of fisc fiscal regulations and tax exemptions, turned charity as a problem of the distribution of profit, making it a matter of market governance through which the social all could be brought within the reach of economic calculation. The colonial recasting of native charity in the idiom of the common good and public utility began to chime with the politics of religious and community reforms animating late 19th century South Asia. Emerging religious, civic, and caste associations 
joint colonial critique of traditional modalities of religion giving to call for the economic resources and time of a newly constituted modern public to support cultural enlightenment, religious reform, and social progress. The call of social religious reformism was answered in earnest by established commercial or banking elites, but also by the emerging urban middle class, constitutive of a novel aesthetic of self-making, individual and collective agency, and public visibility. Said Ahmed Khan, for instance, could draw on donation and support from wealthy Muslims to establish the Muslim Anglo-Oriental College of Aligarh, later to become Aligarh Muslim University, an institution which became the template for modern Muslim education across the subcontinent, from Peshawar to Colombo. Charity then took up explicit pedagogical scope of transforming the spiritual and material well-being, as well as the cultural and social dispositions of donors and recipients. Such an impetus towards eliciting individual and collective social responsibility brought together a 19th century colonial discourse about the idleness of the non-working poor, the moral value of education and work, and the wastefulness of superstitions with various strands of Hindu, Buddhist, and Islamic reformism and revivalism. The articulation of novel imaginations of charitable giving and the introduction of legal frameworks for the regulation of charitable institutions, however, were often contested and fraught with tensions and contradictions. For instance, we find the North Indian sectarian monastic orders, which colonial legislation had classified as private rather than charitable institution, face the challenge of Hindu reformist organization, in particular the Hindu Mahasabha, over the administration and misuse of wealth donated by devotees. Within the first half of the 20th century, monastic orders did not yield to reformist demands to turn themselves into charitable trust devoted to supporting the constitution of an expansive Hindu national community. In post-independence India, they deployed the reformist notions of charity as a means to shore up their own project of social religious transformation of a Hindu public. South Asian anti-colonial nationalism stimulated further conceptual and practical transformation of indigenous charity into service for the moral, cultural, and economic upliftment of a soon-to-become independent nation. Such ideas also fueled by the, Gandhian, by the Gandhian emphasis on welfare for all, Sarvodaya. The Mahatma's doctrine of trustship was a compromise that enabled Gandhi to hold on two key ethical principles, non-possession, and non-violence. The sin of wealth accumulation in the hands of a few could be non-violently mitigated by persuading the capitalist that he held his riches in trust on behalf of those who, after all, helped him to accumulate his capital. In his own lifetime, Gandhi had a few spectacular successes in winning over some capitalist acolytes to his cause, in men like uh, G.D. Berla and Jamanal Bajaj. The land gift and the village gift movements led by Gandhian activist Vinoba Bhave also carried forward such ideas in the immediate aftermath of Indian independence. But in a parallel move, the political theology of Abu Alala Maududi, the founder of Jamaat Islam, set sounds giving, zakat and sadaqah, as a means to provide social welfare in a future polity which would be inspired neither by capitalism nor communism, but by Islamic principle of mutuality and redistribution. In contemporary India, the rhetoric of Seva continues to be mobilized by secular, religious, or community-based organization to elicit donation from an often transnational public of followers, devotees, and well-wishers to sustain countless public initiatives from building a simple roadside bus shelter con to constructing and running super speciality hospitals and colleges. This initiative, as I've argued in my research on Muslim philanthropists in Kerala and Sri Lanka, often bring together market principle and charitable endeavor to deliver services, particularly in the fields of education and health. There is little doubt that the aesthetics of associationism and voluntarism inspire by 19th century and early 20th century religious reformism, nationalist politics, 
and middle-class modernism continue to inspire their rhetoric and practices of contemporary charities. However, much charitable activity often takes place within the ambit of individual religious traditions or communities. This is most obvious where the results of charitable activity are the construction of religious buildings, mosques, temples, and churches. But it is also clear that in the individual or collective acts of charity tend to link giver and receivers within the same community, or at least they are imagined to, be so, to do so. More generally, there is a degree of tension between particularistic and universalistic approaches to charity, and a continual questioning as to whether or not charity should be aimed only to our own, or extended to a broader humanitarian constituency. As underscoring recurrent allegations about the possible instrumental use of charity to foster religious conversion, the social body of a post-colonial nation interpolated and mobilized through charity is indeed experienced in practice through the lenses of community, religion, or region. In post-colonial India, changes in corporate governance, the emergence of new large corporate players, and political demands for a more decisive contribution by private businesses to national development have also impelled the work of existing charitable foundation and to the consolidation of corporate philanthropy, the precursor of contemporary programs of corporate social responsibility. Take the case of a transnational corporation such as Tata, whose funding partners were Parsi. One of India's oldest, largest, and most established companies, Tata has been engaged in philanthropic activities since its establishment in 1868. Instrumental not only in the development of India heavy in industry, but in the funding of the independence movement, Tata enjoyed a closer relationship with the Indian National Congress since its inception. And in post liberalization India, it has become a standard bearer for corporate social responsibility. The new philanthropic capitalism, which encompasses corporate social responsibility, promises an alternative to state led development in which the social and environmental cost of rapid industrialization might be well ameliorated by business itself. Corporate social responsibility is often presented as a radical break from colonial forms of industrial philanthropy and post-colonial paternalism. But like its predecessor, it continues to be a means to negotiate relations with state and market and to objectify pious disposition. The genealogy of legislation regulating charitable organizations in post-independence India suggests that the apparent continuities between pre-colonial charity and contemporary corporate uh, philanthropy are built, firstly, on a radical separation of charity from profit making, and later on the imbrication of the former into the latter via the articulation of a nation of general public utility, at the core of a modern charitable trust. In contemporary modality of corporate so social responsibility, then, <coughs> philanthropy becomes a technology <coughs> of neoliberal governance through which the rights of citizens are mediated by the responsibilities of corporations, portrayed as trustees of a nation's wealth. By folding philanthropy into the working of corporations and business, in recent, recent legislation the object of corporate social responsibility interventions are no longer imagined either through the intimacy of kingship and the hierarchical mutuality of caste and community or the political boundaries of the nation, but as members of communities that are understood as a, the environment of business. We should be aware, though, that whilst in practice, the wills practices of giving have historically contributed to projects of self and com community making, they have done so in a, on a translocal and transregional stage. South Asian trading communities have been prominent in the port cities of the Indian Ocean for centuries, constituting networks which facilitated flows of credit and commercial information, but also for the circulation of moral reasoning concerning the ways individual wealth could and should contribute 
to the collective good. Sarfasian religious endowments and charity might be extended as far as the Arabian Peninsula to objectify and assert partic participation to theologies, cultures, and politics of a trans-regional trans Ummah. And here we can see, for example, when Islam of Hyderabad's uh, uh, charities established to sustain pilgrims to Mecca. Or could be mobilized to support political or humanitarian causes beyond the confines of a subcontinent. For example, the, uh, the Khilafat movement was sustained by substantial donation by the public. With the influences of South Asian modalities of giving on the development of modern European or North American philanthropy remain largely unexplored, there is ample evidence of the increasing importance of diaspora charity on South Asian economies and politics. Diaspora communities are encouraged to make donations to formal and informal organizations supporting the development processes in the native or ancestral homeland, whereby the flow of migrant remittances goes alongside the transnational circulation of charity. The economic and intellectual resources of the diaspora are also mobilized with increasing regularity to sustain political life in South Asia. At the same time, a professional approach to charity built around notions of bureaucratic efficiency and economic efficacy, as well as the discourse of charity as development, have become currency in charitable organizations across South Asia partly as an effect of a circulation of practices and discourses brought to the region by international charities and mediated by local partners. Pre-colonial -pre modalities of giving are clearly different from organized form of charity and corporate philanthropy that emerged in South Asia since the middle of the 19th century and have continued to undergo transformation in the post-independence and economic liberalization period. With colonial and post-colonial modernity transform understanding and technologies of giving, these processes of change are taking place at different speeds and not always according to a predictable teleology. Morphing the devotional idiom of seva and the sacrificial new nature of dana into modern notions of humanitarianism and active citizenship, or mobilizing the religious obligation to give zakat for the sake of community or national development requires substantial moral and, and epistemological shift. The work of turning religious obligations into civic duty towards community and nation, or refashioning religious giving as humanitarian care, care is inevitably unstable. Although the contemporary South Asian public uh, responds to the fundraising appeals of charitable organizations, Individuals continue to distribute a substantial part of their donation in person and to one another. And it is through these everyday acts of impulse, uh, the, and it is through these everyday acts that the impulse of giving reveals itself in all its complexity. In South Asian affective economies of giving, compassion for a beggar, fear for a nature occurs, securing the auspiciousness of a life cycle ritual or success in a business deal negative planetary configuration in one's horoscope, or a sudden illness, feeling of responsibility for the welfare of poor kin or neighbor, and more, are all motivation for giving, which might intersect with, but cannot be entirely subsumed into ethics of religious piety, civic duty, and national or community development. While we might ask questions about the motivation behind charitable act, we also have to recognize the complexities and ambiguities of the context in which giving takes place. By concentrating on the intentions, orientation, and practices of givers, individuals, and organizations, existing research has almost entirely erased the presence of those who receive charity or are the object of charitable interventions. This is neither an anonymous nor heterogeneous body or recipients, and seldom are the latter passive beneficiaries of charity in whatever form it might come. Indeed, the experience of receiving is just as unruly as the practice of giving. In my research, I demonstrate that by receiving and giving zakat and sadaqah, the poor and working class Muslim in Colombo, in a Colombo neighborhood, imagine inclusion and belonging to the wider Muslim community a participation which is not contingent 
upon the mediation and pedagogical interventions of charitable and middle class pious donors, but hinges on the mutuality of social proximity and the pleasure of fulfilling God's will. At the same time, a recipient might prefer the lesser and but more reliable help of their equals to the unpredictable flow of charity, and in any case, the shame, status, hierarchies, or possible ritual dangers entailed in receiving no reciprocal charitable donation can be mitigated or altogether undermined by resignifying charity in the language of the rights and duties of kingship and patronage. The subject position of recipients then lays bare both the power and dangers of South Asian politics of giving and receiving charity. Let me conclude by addressing the gender underpinnings of charitable giving, as well as its gendering. By representing women as vulnerable and helpless, whose predicaments call for protection, support, and eventually reform, the neo-patriarchal developmental discourse of colonial and post-colonial modernity have turned, in particular impoverished and destitute South Asian women, into the favorite object of charity. Indeed, it is often poor women and their children who appear nowadays in photographs published in newspaper or website of charitable organizations seeking to draw donations from local and global publics. However, such a feminization of poverty and as a result of charity itself also chimes with women's practical role in charitable acts. More often than not, the status and class hierarchies and gender and reproduced by receiving charity are assuaged by delegating to women the shameful task of approaching wealthy givers for help or, as my own research shows, queuing publicly to receive hands out from pious benefactor. And, we, and within the circles of kin and neighbors, it is women who discreetly extend assistance to needy relatives or acquaintances in an attempt to conceal or make more palatable the uncomfortable status distance between giver and recipients, which are reciprocated giving inevitably objectifies. Given that South Asian women have been represented as passive recipients of charitable intervention, it comes as little surprise that the generous patron who mobilizes various modalities of giving to ensure clients' allegiance and to build political alliances is invariably represented as male, the iconic South Asian big man. With some studies have explored the expansive masculinity engendered by such a politics of giving, little is known about South Asian women as givers and donors. Historical evidence suggests that in pre-colonial South Asia, royal women as well as women associated to temple worship could and did support a variety of religious institutions through grants and donations. The ascendancy of colonial forms of charity so South Asian women participating enthusiastically in philanthropic initiatives alongside their wealthy husbands or male relatives, albeit at times independently from them, to embody a gender aesthetics of compassion and benevolence which satisfied the demand of modern class respectability and sophistication. The world of upper caste and wealthy benefactress eventually blended with Gandhi's call for Indian women to join the independent struggle by doing seva, for the nation as a whole. Arguably, this practice of civic engagement not only opened up the public sphere of civil society to women, but laid the foundation for social work to serve as a gateway for the political career of women. Novel configuration of seva, or service, that is, have become a means through which women can engage with and participate to political society. We have seen the although charity and philanthropy cannot be reduced to epiphenomena of political or economic relations, neither can they be separated from hierarchies and interests engendered by the latter. Whether driven by piety, humanitarianism, or, or barefaced instrumentalism, charitable acts participate in the constitution or reproduction of economies and elicit, and, and elicit implicitly or explicitly, specific disposition and subjectivities which can be mobilized as tools for governing donors and recipients alike. Charity and philanthropy might allow for the objectification of, of ethics of compassion for the destitute, 
provide a degree of social protection for the poor, sustain the development ambitions of communities and nations, or more generally, promote the common good. But the resources mobilized through charity and philanthropy might be extended selectively or withdrawn at the whim of a giver, locking recipients into hierarchies of status, gender, class, and power within communities and nations and beyond. Indeed, this is a far cry from the ideals of right-based citizenship underpinning post-colonial state welfare. And yet, as neoliberal reform blur the boundaries between beneficent, be, beneficence and state-led provisions of social care and protection, but drawing charitable organization and corporate social responsibility programs into the delivery of, of services or development programs, for instance, charity and philanthropy, and the politics of subjection and subjectification they entail will become even more visible in their everyday life of South Asians in the year to come. Thank you. Before our distinguished speaker answers a few questions, I am just tempted to give a few reflections of mine. Excellent. Because I teach economic anthropology. Uh -huh. And then this topic is actually very much relevant to an economic anthropologist. And, uh, and Professor Rosella covered a very elaborate canvas starting from indigenous practice of charity and then gradually moving into the global practices, in between tracing out the economic history of charity and philanthropy. Long back, it was Marcel Maas who gave us a very simple formulation about the obligation to give, obligation to receive and obligation to reciprocate. So starting from the such simplistic formulations, we have come a long way in understanding the practice, nature of charity and philanthropy. I was just wondering at what point of time in human history the terms charity and philanthropy become relevant. Because certainly in the very early societies these terms are not relevant. There is always sharing, caring in these simple societies. That is what we teach in anthropology. Collectivities are more important. And we have practices of gift giving, reciprocity, redistribution. To what extent we can think of charity and philanthropy, for example, in a practice like potlatch? Or to what extent actually there is charity and philanthropy in corporate social responsibility. I am getting number of ideas actually when listening to this lecture uh, in a uh, Professor Osella covered a lot of canvas in cross-culturally in time and space and also very elaborate treatment on the nature of charity starting from European practices to South Asian practices. So we have in the charity very interesting part is the transformation or transition or uh, transcendency from material to non-material. So you have humanitarian considerations, political considerations or political mobilization of resources for various movements and other things again coming from charity and all that. I think it's a very interesting canvas actually covering the charity and philanthropy part the religious dimension, the political dimension, and also the social dimension. But earlier we were treating most of the time functional dimensions of gift giving, functional dimensions of reciprocity. Now we have the various other dimensions. So I don't want to 
going to several interesting things which are coming to my mind but uh, now we'll go for questions i think not many questions i think we do each time so 420 now maybe okay let us see how many questions will be there If there are too many questions we'll stop at some point okay <laughs> When people gather their thoughts, maybe I can uh, address some important issue that uh, Professor Rao uh, drew up. So yes, absolutely. When do, does the uh, idea of charity and philanthropy comes about? And you know what I try to do in my paper is that uh, really I was trying to reflect back on the fact that very often now we just translate all sorts of practice within the idiom of, of charity and philanthropy. Typically, in a place like India, philanthropy and charity is very much in every, you know, in, in, in the sort of current vocabulary uh, to describe various practices of giving. What I was trying to, to show is that not only there is a precise history of charity and philanthropy which is embedded in a sort of Christian secular tradition of giving, uh, but also the type of transformation that this type of practices takes over time. But it is a sort of non-linear type of transformation, okay? And I think it's very important to, to, to bear that in mind because I think all to, otherwise we always end up locked in this way of thinking whereby we say, well, you know, in Europe or the West there is charity and philanthropy and in India there is gift giving. Finish. So there is this sort of complete difference and the two things are incomparable. And what I was trying to, to show, and that's sort of addressing your question, what is it that brings together potlatch and, and, and CSR, or the material or non-material, is exactly that uh, the idea of, of, of charity very often is built on the sense that altruism and, and self-interest uh, really cannot come together. That, you know, the world of charity and the world of economic practice are really completely different. What I've been trying to show, but not only within the South Asian context, historically, but also in the European and North American context, uh, charity and philanthropy have always been a means to express various forms of economic practice. And likewise, economic practice expresses itself through various modalities of giving, whether you call it uh, um, charitable or, or, or not. And it is absolutely so. What is it that brings together Potlat and CSR? That these are two different forms of, of, of giving. And maybe, you know, you can think here, rather than thinking about Potlat and, and CSR, one could say, what is it that brings together the ideology of Potlat to the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism? Because in both cases, you have economic action the, uh, you, you have a, 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 an action which, is, which has an economic relevance, but it's done for its own sake. Okay? So perhaps when we begin to think in the terms and, and, and move away from this contraposition between altruism and self-interest, then we have a wider comparative framework to begin to understand as to why uh, nowadays we're so preoccupied with charity and philanthropy, and why is it that we see charity and philanthropy as the means through which we can redress the, short -timing, the shortcomings of capitalism. Because eventually, if we see charity and philanthropy always as being embedded within economic action, so really, uh, charity and philanthropy cannot be a, a solution for the shortcoming of capitalism and markets, because it's really uh, uh, um, trying to solve this, something with uh, the same means that have created the problem to begin with, uh, so it doesn't work. Sometimes we can see charity and philanthropy as investment also. Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, you know, that is, you know, I didn't have time to elaborate in my, in my research, but I mean, that was uh, clearly a, 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 a one of the ways through which uh, Muslim entrepreneurs and, and, and shopkeepers and businessmen in, in particular in Colombo, both in Canada, talk about uh, giving zakat and sadaqa as an investment and as a form of insurance for their business. As an investment whereby you give and, and something comes back to you in, 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 in a much bigger form, and as an insurance, so you protect yourself against bad things that can happen to you. That's why I think I begin to think about charity and philanthropy through the lens of sacrifice. Because in, in, in the sort of the logical sacrifice, there is also an incremental logic. You know, I give something, 
which is always, you know, something on myself. But this, what I give, it always comes back. In a, you know, there is always a profit, which is accrued through sacrifice, if you like. Hinduism, it comes in the next life. <laughs> not only, not only. It comes in this life as well. I mean, there are different forms of sacrifice which have more immediate effect. Like, for example, when you donate money because you want your son or daughter to pass exams. You cannot wait for your son and daughter to pass exams in the next life. You want something much more closer uh, to, <laughs> to the time. Yeah? yeah. OK. Um, that was really very enjoyable, especially your effort to avoid a reductionist reading of um, charity. Um, but I wanted to reflect on this from uh, the standpoint of my own work on Vinoba's Bhutan. And one of the things that occurred to me was you're trying to distinguish between um, interest and piety, even as you show that they are complementary in the practices. But I, I'm wondering whether we need to add something else here. So there is the ethics of pity, which is why people have been very, very reticent to work on practices of charity, mm. the ethics of pity. Mm. Um, and then you're, you're, of course, saying that we don't have to see the uh, humanitarian um, practices as some, something completely devoid of religious merit, that these can go together. But I came across um, instances when I was researching on Bhutan where many people gave out of a sense of plenitude. And Vinoba, in fact, when he wants to, when he has to extend this, people often said, people came to him and said, why do you think we poor people cannot participate in this dan thing? And that's how he came up with Shramadhan, which is a donating effort. Um, so I think uh, maybe we should add that ethics of plenitude because there it is not just otherworldly merit. And it is also not just pity. It is a sense of being bestowed. You know the gift pledge that Warren, uh, Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffet have started? I think that's also very similar. We have so much and we would like to share. There is some idea of the flow of wealth and cosmic plenitude that I think is also at work in uh, moving the people to act, uh, not just formally, but informally. So I just wanted to throw that in there. And there, I think it's um, apart from plenitude, or probably as part of plenitude, is the esteem for the doni rather than just pity. For the Tony and Maria Haim, I think, has done some work on those ethics of esteem, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, y yes, I mean, what can I say? You're, you're, you're right, giving for plenitude, uh, yes, and to some extent, the literature on, on uh, you know, the classic South Asian big man is very much about uh, giving by plenitude, even you know, the sort of some of the literature on, on um, Hindu. Uh, kingship, it is about uh, giving uh, out of plentitude. And very often we find that in, in uh, also the relationship that uh, people establish with deities, you know, the sort of goodwill uh, and the blessing of deities comes out of, you know, they flow out of, out of their, 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 their plentitude and, and, uh, and all that. Uh, you're absolutely right, but there is far more to be said. And, you know, and that, I think, uh, to me, was quite revealing when I shift my attention from those who give charity to those who receive charity. I actually found something which was totally unexpected to me, partly because uh, uh, within uh, um, Islam, for example, the giving of zakat is an injunction. Uh, for only for certain people, those whose wealth ex exceed a certain uh, a, a certain limit, and yet talking to people, uh, those who normally receive zakat, uh, I f and, and, and various forms of charity, I found that in fact they were quite proud of the fact that even if they had very little money and they didn't have the obligation to give zakat, and even if their zakat was not recognized very often by a, a, other Muslim as zakat. They were actually uh, doing that, and they, d they were doing that with much uh, uh, pleasure. Why people do that? Uh, the way in which I saw it, it was very much about uh, this sense of participating to 
uh, a Muslim community from which they, uh, in contemporary neoliberal and, and, and fast expanding Colombo, they, 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 they were clearly excluded. But also, and importantly, something that we, 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 we forgot when we think about this, uh, this type of practice, for the pleasure of uh, giving according to God's in injunction. You know, we, I'm giving because I like it. You know, I feel like uh, I'm a, it gives me satisfaction because that's what uh, God tells me to do, and, and I do it. Even if I, even if I have, you know, in fact, I write in the paper, even if I only have 10 rupees, I, I will give. And people will give. And actually, interestingly, although we very often we, com we concentrate on the big philanthropists, people who give, you know, millions of dollars or billions of dollars for charity, Worldwide, it is actually poor uh, people who give far more than others, okay? People who give uh, money when they come out of a church, uh, people who would give money to beggars when they come out of a temple or, or, or a mosque, etc. These tend to be very often poor people or people of very, very limited means. And it is very often their collective efforts that make on uh, uh, for the wealth uh, uh, that is accumulated by international organization, right? So when we have an organization like Save the Children that can uh, operate uh, and set themselves as, you know, the charitable organization, the NGO, that uh, does all sorts of intervention, in fact, that's very much the effort and the donation of very small people. Uh, 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 which are put together, and interestingly, they're completely erased in this process. Well, call me old-fashioned, but I return to a question that <laughs> Professor Rao was asking before. Look, <clears throat> to give you, to, to put it in, 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 in another way, okay? So the 2008 economic crisis in, in the UK, very much focused on the working of, of banks and bankers, for instance, right? So these guys, were uh, uh, accused, they st stood accused very often of having been, to have done illegal activities. And having done illegal activities very often because by trading with each other, by knowing each other. So there was this, this sense that, you know, the market practices should be disembedded completely in order to avoid uh, the perils of corruption and all that. But how do you do that? There was the suggestion that when capitalism had to be socialized, hence that you had to bring, you, you had to embed it again into something else, hence to create the same problem that were uh, there to begin with. In other words, that's why I say, call me uh, uh, old fashioned, but I don't think, <clears throat> you know, there, there might be good capitalism uh, and bad capitalism, but it's still capitalism. It's still, it's, it's still a, a, a modality or, 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 or a way to, to uh, accumulating wealth, using wealth. Using but, for example, if we have to design a vaccine, mm. see, uh, you know, inclusive uh, or like, you know, thinking about how much poor can afford, how much. So these are all kind of, more, I mean, you include all these parameters into your capitalistic interest mm. so that you are in a way more you know, socialistic, and still you have business interests? Well, it is, it, it, it is a big question, and I think each one of us has different uh, opinions on, on, on charity and philanthropy. But I think there are, for certain, for certain issues, I do resent having to pay twice. You know, I pay tax to the state, and I think that the, the, the state should make use of a tax to provide services. I shouldn't then pay again through my charity in order for the services to be provided. It, it, I, I don't think it can work like that. I can give for my own pleasure. You know, I can give and I do give uh, because I feel giving, but not because if I don't give, then services are not provided. I think there is, uh, uh, there is, there is a difference between that. And I think his attention that very often uh, 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 appears when you talk, in my research, when people talk about giving directly, you know, typically during, you know, if you're a Muslim during Ramadan, people will come queuing outside your house to ask for, uh, and you will distribute money, as opposed to giving to a charitable organization. Now, very often people talk in these terms, you know, 
I'm giving for the pleasure of giving. I'm not giving for development purposes. Development purposes is not my, my uh, 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 problem. I'm giving because the Quran Sharif says that I should give. It's one of, my, it's one of the five pillars of Islam. I should give. So I give. Okay, and it, it, it even becomes, uh, you know, and that to some extent, you know, we we're talking about dan before, you know, very often that is the sense that you give, but the, ob the object, the recipient is totally irrelevant because it's the act of giving which is important. It's not the condition of a recipient or what you do to the recipient, right? So in classical zakat, it doesn't matter who the recipient is. You know, it is something that you are obliged to do and to partake of something that belongs to you, but in fact already belongs to something else. But it is about an obligation to yourself. Okay, neuroscience supports it, because in neuroscience, giving actually makes us happier. So there is self... Yeah, uh, well... I mean, I mean, according I to know. neuroscience, we know uh, that giving makes... I mean, this activates certain reward circuits. People essentially feel happy. Uh, yeah. uh, there, there is... Well, perhaps, and in fact, people talk about you. Know, you know that is what economists have come out when they try to justify in economic terms why people give money. They come out with this idea of a warm glow, you know, this sort of sense of pleasure that you get by uh, uh, um, by giving. There is scientific evidence too. I mean, we cannot rule out it completely. I mean, <laughs> no, no, no. Of course, of course. There is also great satisfaction in receiving. <laughs> No, you're just speaking about the you know, sense of community imagination and participation in response to Professor Vasandi's question. Mm. Um, I'm just wondering whether it also worked the other way around, because, uh, you know, does Fishers in the community actually brings out on the cause of this, you know, charity intervention? I'm speaking particularly from my ethnographic field experience from the, 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 the you know, diasporic Sikh community, uh, charity to the separate Sikh uh, homeland movement, where there is a lot of you know participation as a community in the beginning, but as it you know went on, it is quite clear that the kind of homeland that being constructed was like a jatish sort of thing, and then that actually created a lot of fissure within the community, you know, uh, philanthropic network. So, do you see such a possibility at all in this? No, no, I, I, absolutely. And what you talk about is very clear, for example, in uh, uh, Tamil charity in, in, in Europe directed towards, you know, especially after the end of the war, directed towards uh, uh, the homeland, very much uh, located in uh, Tamil temples, which have been completely rife with uh, 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 conflicts. Um, Conflicts not only in terms, you know, the sort of old story of Tamil Alam coming, coming back, etc., but also, you know, why should we give to this village instead of the other village, and uh, etc. So, no, you're absolutely right. Like uh, any sort of uh, economic transaction, the type of communities which are uh, uh, constituted at both ends of the giving and the receiving tend to be always fragmented and also very much... Uh, uh, limited in time for what they do. And in fact, that's what I was trying to do. They were trying to say also that in the context of South Asia in particular, but not only, there is this sense that, you know, on the one end, uh, sort of contemporary charity and philanthropy should have a wider humanitarian scope, but very, mo very often is about, uh, is being directly in, into very narrow, in a very narrow sense to specific communities, even, you know, to specific people within the community in a particular area, um, etc. So, you know, for example, um, as we are in Hyderabad, you know, the activities of TANA, the, the American Association, was very much directed not to the wider community, but of course only to specific uh, caste cluster uh, within, uh, within Andhra. And even within this caste cluster, within this particular uh, areas, uh, uh, etc. So it was very much about, you know, the reproduction, or eventually the reproduction of caste privilege. Now, of course, Tana is split into, into two, that is the Telugu, uh, 
um, the Telugu and the Andhra part. Uh, but it tends to work in, in that particular way. Although, of course, there is always the rhetoric of, you know, we are doing it for, for the welfare now of all. Now separate association for Telangana. Yes, 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 yes. There are two associations. Telangana association is separate. Yes, yes, from the Andhra association. Tana, Nata. Yes, yes. But these are also very active, you know, these guys are, you know, over the years have mobilized millions of dollars. Um, scholarship and education. In India, many children are taught from their childhood that uh, your hand should always be above rather than below, that you are in a position, you should be in a position all, uh, of uh, giving all the time rather than taking and seeking from, some, from anyone else. So, I felt that why when we start an entrepreneurship or uh, when we start with an agenda of making money also, First, we think that we, go, we should go on making money and at the end of the time, we should give it back to the society. So, we loot from someone else and then we give to someone else who making them lazy or something else. Why don't we consider the idea of social entrepreneurship? Why do we separate philanthropy as a separate thing and money making and uh, business as a separate thing? But instead, we could uh, intervene both of them while at the same time and give to the people through them uh, any of the economic activities through business and all. Second thing, when, when anyone is willing to give money to the people, uh, either there is a uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that uh, this, there is always something, quack, a, uh, there is always an air of quackery of when we talk about charities and philanthropies. And uh, why uh, they want to show up, whether it's Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or uh, Clinton Foundation, everyone want to show up that it is them who are doing the work. And uh, always sh to show that we are giving it for... Uh, for free, with a high hand uh, attitude of high-handedness. Instead, uh, there were officers like Shankaran who used to give half of his salary to the uh, people of the same district when he was collector, saying that that is a government scheme to distribute you people 2,000 or 3,000 under so-and-so scheme because he didn't want them to feel that uh, they are taking something for free. So, uh, but rather they deserve that through the government as a form of support or something. So, if we, if we adopt the measures, me measures of social entrepreneurship or... Uh, some other format to give the people, they also feel there is a sense of self-respect and dignity for the people who are taking it also. Then, what is stopping, uh, stopping from uh, happening this? I don't know. I would say capitalism as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> but because I'm, uh, I'm old-fashioned. No, no, no. In the sense, I don't know. I mean, you know, these are big issues. You know, social entrepreneurship, yes, to an extent, but it really depends on who's doing what and what for. Uh, you know, for example, you know, these big foundations, uh, the Gates Foundations and, and others, you know, of course they had a, 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 huge, a huge impact, but also they had, a, a, you know, a deleterious effect also to an extent because they are so powerful and they, mobi they can mobilize such a large amount of money. So, uh, so, for example, a lot has been done on HIV and AIDS in, in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but malaria, no, no one really gives a uh, two hoots about malaria or filaria or Japanese encephalitis because this has no caught the attention and the imagination of these big foundations, right? Because, you know, for them, what is important is HIV and AIDS and operating on that. So all other uh, 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 diseases, for, for instance, for which uh, uh, it is important to, 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 to take action and, in fact, they have a far, more, far bigger effect uh, they have been totally underfunded because no one is interested because all the resources are going there. So when we're talking about this sort of big corporate social responsibility, social entrepreneurship and all that, we have to think a little bit. And that's why, you know, it is important for, all, for us anthropologists here. We have a role as anthropologists because we can inquire ethnographically about the working of this, uh, of this organization, of this project beyond their rhetoric, beyond the way in which they, 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 they seek to present themselves. So in a way, and, and that's when it becomes important to bring together the perspective and the practices of those who give to the perspectives, the perspective and the experience of those, of those who receive. Unless you bring the, that together, you always end up in this position to say that either you know, charity philanthropy is absolutely wonderful or it's completely rubbish. Uh, <clears throat> but it's only, in fact, by uh, uh, empirical inquiry that we can establish how these organizations work and, uh, and, and what they can and they cannot do.
Yeah. Uh, also, an image which I get is get many times is that the b many billions of dollars are being wasted without much of planning going into it. When it happens in the time of investment or a business, there is a lot of planning. Uh, all organization organized way it goes. But in when it comes to philanthropy, a charity, uh, many people set aside a part of salary and they give it to a charity foundation and forget about it altogether. So. Uh, at a, uh, how to uh, address this thing like uh, <laughs> and, and one more uh, is, is it as a just a stand publicity stand showing that if they don't do it maybe these uh, very highly leftist forces or like socialist or communist forces will be uh, asking for I don't have a solution I don't think we can reach to determine Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hello, sir. Um, my question is, just tell me your opinion. Uh, if I say char charity and philanthropy is uh, done because of coercion. It's done because of? Coercion. Because of force. Force. Yeah, coercion. Yes. Sometimes it's done, well, you know, in certain contexts where is the obligation to give. You know, whether you call that coercion or not. I mean, if in, in certain uh, uh, Christian churches it is an obligation to, to give uh, in different ways, but it, it is an obligation and it is public. But giving zakat is an obligation. There is no coercion to do it, but it is an obligation. On behalf of the Center for Regional Studies and the School of Social Sciences, thank Professor Vassella uh, for a rather stimulating, I would say, a thought-provoking lecture this afternoon. This was indeed a, a two de force uh, lecture this afternoon and uh, on charity and philanthropy. <laughs> but also very generously over the past two days, uh, you have given your time, your intellectual inputs uh, to all of us. Uh, whether be it as research scholars or at the faculty. And uh, thanks to you all uh, for doing, taking the time and I appreciate uh, all that you have done this past three days. I uh, also thank the, the Dean Social Sciences, Professor Venkatra, for presiding this afternoon, this meeting, uh, for this proceedings today. I also want to take the opportunity to thank the Vice Chancellor for uh, making his visit by Professor Osella to be a possibility. Uh, we were assisted for this afternoon's program to be uh, in a big way by the PRO and the PRO's office and the staff. Uh, so did the staff of the Vice Chancellor as well as for the Dean, uh, in the Social Sciences, and many others, uh, some named, some not named, <laughs> for the logistical purposes as well as for organizing this uh, distinguished lecture. Uh, perhaps the best part of this task of vote of thanks is to uh, get to thank you all for making your presence this afternoon at this place and keeping this campus a very vibrant one. Thank you all for coming this afternoon, and thank you all for again for making this uh, a wonderful uh, lecture, and also for the past two days and three days that you have been with us uh, during this visit of Professor Osella.